All right. Well, glad you're with us, and uh, hopefully this recording will work for everybody. Uh, we want to jump back right back into uh, chapter two, so uh, I'm going to share those um, the screen with you on the the notes, and we'll kind of go through this just a little bit. All right, so we've been talking about aggregates and we went through the definitions. Um, I think we got all the way through. This is an important slide here to make sure everyone understands what a uh, sieve or the larger versions that they might use actually at a quarry, they, they'd call screens. But uh, these are standardized. So it just means that um, when they manufacture these, that, uh, you know, there's certain tolerances. And so you, you, you'll get the same results uh, if you have a number four sieve or whatever size sieve that uh, anyone else would use. So, um, and of course they make these from uh, pretty, pretty large, maybe. These are typically like nine inch diameter. So they'll make these from, I think we might have a three inch. You can imagine that's, there's, there are not many holes in a nine inch diameter sieve that are three inches square. Um, all the way down to we've got a 200 they actually make i think maybe like a 400 or 290 which should be super small almost like cloth but uh, we'll talk more about that in just a little bit um so i think we had stopped here and we looked at all the different uses of aggregates from uh, roads to concrete and asphalt retaining walls and all those and we're gonna spend a little more time going through some of those we already talked about the different sources uh you, you can really break that down into two categories one would be natural. Um, not a whole lot of natural sources around here, but if you're along the uh, Ohio or the Mississippi, a lot of those times they have a lot of bank gravels and sands that they have that they can sell. Those aggregates typically are smooth. Uh, they're rounded or sub-rounded. Around here we mainly crush, so you'd have uh, manufactured stone. So quarries, you know, they blast and excavate huge uh, chunks of rock out of the ground and then they crush them down to the size that they desire, the sizes that they can sell, uh, all the way down to sand. And so most of the uh, yellowish sand that you see uh, in this area is manufactured sand. And natural sand tends to be, you know, of course, more brownish. Uh, I don't want to say a whole lot about this slide. It should take you back to seventh grade uh, physical science, but Obviously, there are different types of rock. We have sedimentary rocks in our area. Uh, so we have a lot of limestone uh, off East River Mountain and around. And, and of course, they crush that. Uh, it's a grayish, typically grayish looking rock. Um, you get up near Beckley and a little bit beyond, you get into a lot of sandstones. Of course, shale is the most abundant um, rock that we have um, in the world. And so there's a lot of shales. Um, they can be relatively soft um, and they can be relatively hard. It, it just depends. They, they tend to weather more than other types of uh, rock uh, because they are on the surface. So, you know, you only say that because typically if we're talking about rock as a construction material, a lot of times we want it to be something that will be durable and will be strong. So, um, you know, that needs to be considered. You, you don't see many quarries that are uh, manufacturing a, a crushed shale. Now if you get down, uh, just an interesting note, if you get down in, you know, I know other parts of the country like the southeast you get, they have slate, uh, which is a, a metamorphic type of rock. So shale and slate are different things. You probably heard of slate, you know, back in the old days they used to write on it. It's, it's a lot harder and um, they actually have, uh, they can produce lightweight aggregates, um, things that we don't have around here. That, and you might use lightweight uh, aggregates for lightweight concrete. Um, this, this fake rock that you see a lot of now that they use on the outside of uh, retaining walls and, and, and foundation walls, they put a lightweight aggregate in. It's a very light product so that it doesn't have problem, uh, you know, adhering to uh, the wall itself. So it's pretty neat, uh, a lot of different things that you run into with the different types of rock. But anyway, let's move on. Let's look at, um, these are out of your text, some of the 
properties of aggregates and their significance. I can go pretty quick through some of these. So, uh, and this is probably something that you'll want to mark in uh, your notes as a test question. And the way that I might do that is I might ask uh, you to list, according to your text, the property of an aggregate and then give an example. So what we'll do here in the next several slides is we'll actually uh, go over just that. So we'll go over, hey, here's the property and then here's an example of that property. So the first one is just weight. So we talked about that there are lightweight ones. Uh, mainly, we see if we if we use aggregate and in, in, in the property that we're interested in is a weight, then we want it to be heavy. So we uh, we line, uh, you know, channels, uh, creek banks, uh, even shorelines with something that will be heavy enough to stay there and resist the wave and water action and protect the soil underneath from eroding or scouring. So, uh, so the weight's good. And there's, there's a few pictures in your uh, text, figure 28A and 28B, and I might have some of those here. On the downstream toes of dams, kind of the same things, and there, and there could be lots of others here. So here you see in this slide actually what we call a gabion basket retaining wall. You see some of these. Typically gabions are like three inch to nine inch in diameter. And so they take these uh, galvanized wire baskets and they're, they, they vary in size, but most of them that you see are like three foot by three foot by six foot long. And uh, they, they fill them with, uh, you know, the gabion stone. And it does a really good job because the stone's heavy enough to stay there and resist the lateral pressure of the soil. And it also allows the, uh, any type of groundwater seepage to just come right on through. A lot of people don't like the looks of these, but if you're building a retaining wall where uh, it's really not going to be seen, then, uh, you know, there's not a problem with that. But so that's a good example of weight. Uh, all right, the next one, strength to resist weathering. So this could be any, anything that's exposed, uh, especially, you know, a, a road, uh, any type of road surface. We could probably even put uh, concrete or, or asphalt here. That'll come up later. But uh, road bases, decorative finishes, and then once again, even erosion protection. So if we laid a piece of shale, uh, if we tried to lay it on a, a river bank or a shoreline or something like that, over time it would just it would just weather and break down into some type of you know soil, silt or clay or something like that. So so that's another one. Um, and then there's a picture once again. So this is actually showing you both weight and being able to resist weathering. Strength to, of mass to transmit a compressive force. So once again, anytime we're going to use uh, an aggregate as, um, you know, a base material or even in concrete, uh, it would be important. Pipe bedding would be a good one here. So in, anytime we're going to load that in that way. Figure 210 is a picture of that. It's not a great picture, but you can just see we've got some type of uh, aggregate. It looks a little more sandy. Uh, wherever this is, but obviously it has to have the strength to support the uh, not only the road material, but the traffic that's involved. Next one, strength of particles to resist being broken, crushed, or pulled apart. So once again, road bases, concrete, those apply a lot of times. Any structural application with aggregate, interlock, and bearing. So most of the time when we're talking about uh, gravels and sands, they're going to get their strength from the friction and the, the particles, uh, you know, kind of rubbing upon one another, interlocking, especially for a manufactured or a crushed stone. So uh, we don't want them to, to be crushed or broken. That would reduce the strength. Uh, res strength to resist wearing by rubbing. This is especially important on road surfaces. A lot of times, uh, You'll see this at uh, intersections where people want to, you know, apply their brakes, and we'll, you know, you'll start to see a road surface being polished. If it looks kind of shiny, uh, then you're starting to see an unsafe condition. So we would prefer to have aggregates that would not, um, you know, be able to to polish by that traffic action or by that rubbing. So. Uh, most of the aggregates we have around here are very good against that. 
And that's just a picture of concrete. And you can kind of see there how the, uh, the surface, the cement that was on the surface is gone. And uh, it looks kind of like a, what we call an exposed aggregate finish, but uh, you can kind of see how that would start to polish over time. And, and if it's a, something that's important that we maintain friction or a surface that's safe, it would be time to resurface that. Uh, this was real easy. So adhesion or the ability to stick to a cement or binding agent, well, asphalt concrete obviously would be predominantly what we would think of there. Um, some aggregates might be slick. If you think of like marbles, if you tried to make concrete out of marbles or asphalt uh, pavement out of marbles, uh, you know, the, the binder or, you know, the asphalt or liquid asphalt or the cement, wouldn't want to bind to that. So it's kind of an odd example, but it gives you an idea what we'd be looking for there. Ability to transfer uh, and or filter water or other fluids can be important. And we don't see this much for drinking water filters anymore. Some, I may say third world countries and places that don't have everything that we're used to having uh, it, it good clean drinking water, they still use uh, filters. So down to a certain size, uh, sand would be able to filter out, of course, dirt, but even bacteria. Um, but there's the next picture probably is something a little maybe different that you're not used to thinking about, but this is what we call, you know, we have a lot of sinkholes around here. If you have um, limestone rock, um, what we call karst topography, then, you know, they're, they're really a, a problem because uh, they just keep kind of uh, eating or, or, or taking the, the soil down deep into the earth. So one of the best ways to uh, kind of mitigate that is to do what we call an inverted drain. So we take large rock, this is cabbage size, they can be even larger, and we uh, put those on the bottom and then we just work our way back to the surface. Uh, notice the geotextile fabric there, and so we can put soil on top of that and then kind of just uh, bring it right back up to grade. So that would be uh, not necessarily filtering, but but uh, but it is filtering because the water can still go down, but not carry any soil with it. Because uh, So that would be the objective there. So uh, aggregates there would play a big part. All right, so uh, just have, Brian, you have any questions on that? All right, very good. Okay, we're gonna spend a little more time with uh, with this next series and we'll, we'll do something. If you got some, a pencil and paper, you might wanna make sure you have that ready. And, uh, and I'll show you, I might show you some Excel uh, things also on here. So we'll see how that goes. So when we talk about common tests on aggregates, uh, at least as far as a construction material, the uh, what you see here is the wash test is, uh, is, is pretty important. You, you'll also see this, or this test called uh, percent passing the 200 sieve or percent finer than the 200 sieve. So, um, and, and what, what you're doing there is you're actually, uh, and, and we'll, we'll even talk about this when we get into uh, the geotechnics, uh, which is a sophomore level class. And we do the same test on soil, but it's actually finding out how much, uh, sometimes they call it uh, fines, or uh, mineral dust uh, that's actually with the aggregate. And it can actually be a bad thing because if you think about uh, like a gravel uh, or a crushed stone, once again, that needs to adhere or bind to asphalt or cement, if it has too, uh, too high a percentage of fines like dust that are uh, with the aggregate, then that can impede that, that adherence. So uh, this test is pretty simple. So we actually start out with uh, an oven dry uh, weight or mass. So uh, Monday we'll, we'll, we'll do this in lab. So uh, we'll have like a bowl full of oven dried material and we will weigh that. So that, that is obtaining the oven dried weight and then what we'll do is we'll actually introduce that into a 200 sieve, okay? So we'll have a 200 sieve in and by itself, and we'll introduce that, uh, we're gonna use fine aggregate, so sand on Monday. Now we'll introduce that into the sieve, and then we'll just put a, a light uh, flow of water. So we don't want too much water that it causes 
uh, splashing or anything to come out of the sieve. So the technique is to uh, ensure that everything either goes through the sieve or is retained or held on the sieve. So we do that with a light agitation of our hand. So one hand is holding the sieve and um, the other hand is just gently uh, massaging and washing the aggregate. And so what you'll see out of the bottom of the sieve is, uh, you know, turbid or, or dirty uh, water. And so we keep washing until the water is clear. So that's, that's very important, you know, if, you, if you're, uh, if I was to ask you, you know, how do we know that uh, you've washed enough or that, you know, everything's through the 200 sieve in, a, in the wash test, it's because the water is clear coming out the bottom. Okay, then we take what's retained. Now, what we're interested in is what's passing, what went through, but that either went down the drain or into a bucket. Some people use a bucket underneath the faucet. So what we do is we actually backwash what's retained in the sieve into a bowl, put it back into the oven, and then we uh, dry it back out. And so, you know, the way that we uh, would find out, let me see if I can pop over here to a whiteboard, see how this goes. Can you see that? Okay, so uh, this will be messy, but percent passing then would equal, you would have your uh, initial, mm, oven dried weight, all right, minus the final oven dried weight divided by the initial oven dried weight times 100. So that's how we would get the percent passing. So in other words, let's just say, let's make some numbers easy here. So let's just say we started out with a thousand uh, grams of oven dried sand or gravel, whatever it is that we're washing, could be soil. And uh, we start off with that. So we got a thousand grams and then we wash it. And when we're finished washing and the water is clear, we've got 800 grams, all right? So that's, after we put it in the oven, we get 800 grams. So if we're wanting to find out, so this ends up being what? 200 over 1,000 times equals 20% passing the 200. That's kind of how that would work. And that's the wash test. All right, any questions on that one? It's really simple. Um, it's, it takes a lot more time when you wash soil, if you can think about that, actually, actually doing that. Uh, but we'll do that in, in 207. That's kind of how it works. All right. Let's see. Okay. So the next test, and we'll spend a good bit of time on this one, because um, i got to work through the calculations with you. It's probably all we'll get through today, and we'll pick it up on Monday. But the next test is what we call a dry sieve analysis. So we don't use water on this one, okay? So it, it still has to be oven uh, dried material, but uh, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna wash it with water. We don't, we don't have to do that because the size of the sieves um, are large enough that the particles can pass through without having to be washed through. So when we compile a nest of sieves, that's a good test question, mark that in your notes. When we compile a nest of sieves, we place the coarsest sieve on the top and the finest sieve on the bottom. Now, uh, what sieves do we use? Well, that depends on what we're trying to do. If we are running a particular test for a particular aggregate, like let's say a number 57 stone or a number 8 stone, well, there's a set of sieves that are designated for that particular aggregate. In the example that uh, we're going to go over in a second, you can see that they start with a four inch and then they work their way all the way down, I think, to a, to a number four. So it's worth noting that there's, I think I mentioned the other day, there's two ways that sieves are designated. Um, the, the larger ones are typically just by, 
you know, by inch, like four inch, three inch, two inch, goes all the way down to, I think, three eighths inches, um, definitely half. And then it picks up with the number four, which is not the size of the opening, but it's the number of holes per linear inch. So a number four sieve would actually have four holes per linear inch, both directions. So it would have 16 holes per square inch. And then that goes all the way down once again to a number, say a number 200, which would be 200 holes per linear inch. All right. So similarly, again, we take a certain amount of oven dried weight uh, or mass, we place that in the uppermost sieve, and then we shake or agitate. We don't invert, obviously, we don't want it going backwards, we want it falling through. And what's gonna happen, we, we shake it until every particle has an opportunity to pass through the sieve that it is being retained on. Even the, the, uh, the larger particles, when you're starting to break down the nest of sieves, you can kind of, uh, you might say manually with your hand, kind of make sure that everything is supposed to be on the sieve that it's retained on. So anyway, though, we shake it, uh, and then we start disassembling the nest of sieves from the top, okay? And as we do that, what we want to uh, find out in the lab, so the data that we will obtain is, what is the individual weight retained on each sieve? And then we keep, we keep disassembling the nest until we get all the way down to the pan, which is on the bottom. If we didn't have a pan and uh, you know, we'd make a mess in the floor. So nothing goes through the pan. So you know, if, I, if I have a number 100 sieve or whatever it is on the bottom, uh, and then I put a pan under that. And so anything that would go through that 100 sieve would obviously be retained on the solid pan. So then what we'll do is we'll perform our calculations. Uh, so there's a table that we'll go through in just a minute. And then I'll show you how to uh, plot the results. All right, so um, can you see this sieve table okay? Okay. Good. All right, so this is the example that's in the book, and I'm gonna go through these calculations with you. Now, I do wanna, I do wanna make mention that uh, all of these numbers are rounded to whole numbers. I would at least uh, recommend using tenths. Um, they're dealing with grams here, but I would do tenths of a gram, and I would even let the calculations, like if you do it in Excel, obviously you don't round, you can just tell it what to, you want to present, but it, does, it doesn't round in the calculations. So um, what we have here is we have each sieve, if you notice over on the left side, so four inch down again, all the way to the number four and then the pan. And then you have the next column that is the individual uh, weight retained, okay? So that is individual weight retained. So uh, I wanna go through this with you just a little bit here. All right, I got this set up in Excel to kind of show you how these numbers work. Uh, let's see. Let's actually go back to here and let's do something here real quick. All right, so we should be back to the table two, three, is that right? Okay, good. All right, so let me just show you by, uh, if I can write on here, kind of how this works. All right, so it is important to you, that you know that's individual weight retained. So I want to go back over once again, just to clarify. So uh, generally when we're doing the, the sieve analysis and we shake it, there's actually a lid that goes on. So when I took the lid off of this and I looked at the four inch sieve, there was zero it didn't have anything on it. So everything went through the four inch, okay? All right, let's go to the three inch. So the three inch sieve here, it had 540 grams of material on it, okay? The inch and a half had 1,090, three quarter, 1908, and so on and so forth. All the way down here to the pan, which had uh, 211 grams. So when we add this column or we sum all these, we get 5,136 grams of material. Okay. 
Now, let's look at percent retained, how this works. This is, uh, again, this is individual. When I show you, uh, keep in mind, this is individual and this is cumulative. So individual percent retained. How we would get this is we would take this number, so it would be zero divided by the total down here, 5136 times 100. That would give me that, okay? Now I'm gonna skip one just because of space here, but let's go to the three quarter inch. So this is gonna be, this number right here is gonna be 1908 divided by 5136 times 100 to put it in percent. And you can check those with your calculator if you want. All right, and, and so on and so forth. So this one, 211 divided by 5136 times 100. Okay, and that's equal to about 4%. Now, once again, I think they probably rounded. So I'm gonna show you this in, uh, I'll show you this in Excel. Good morning, Kristen. All right, we got an Excel sheet up. Everybody see that? All right, good, thank you. All right, so I've copied these numbers in. So these are just the uh, individual weight retained again. I'm gonna come back to this column in just a little bit, but right here is the sieve uh, numbers or sizes that you saw. All right, so let's, let's go over, um, they did individual, I'm sorry, I'll change this. Individual, what, percent? Is that what it did? Percent retained. Let me fix my spreadsheet. There's a couple different ways you can do these. Not a big deal. All right, so uh, this number right here, if you watch how I would do this, it would be equal to, uh, I need to do one thing first. I need a total here. So this is gonna be sum, Okay, uh, this there. Okay, there's my sum. All right. So for the first sieve, this is going to be equal to this number divided by this number. And uh, I don't know how how familiar you are with Excel, but I'm going to be dividing each of these. Um, down column E by the same total. So I wanna hold that E14. There's actually a, it's either F4 or something. I'm gonna try F4. Boom, there it is. F4 puts the dollar signs where you can do that manually in, in the E14 and that'll hold that cell. So it won't change the column or the row. Just so you know, I don't know if you know that about Excel, but if you want, if you want one to change and not the other, don't, don't put the dollar sign or do put the dollar sign, but the dollar sign will hold it and not let it change. All right, then we want to go what times 100 to put it in percent. Ah, something happened on me there. Went crazy. We'll fix it. No worries. All right, maybe I needed brackets. I can use some brackets. All right, times 100. Or I guess. Um, going on. I guess we could go and make it like a percentage format. Either way. Ah, zero. <laughs> Whatever. I tell you what I want to do. I'm going to change this. I am going to format this column uh, so that it's a number and it's at least one decimal. So I'm going to do that real quick. Okay. Now that I've done that, I can just kind of, I usually go control C and then uh, hit enter. And there you go. So if you can see the ones in the book, I'm not sure they're, these are these are not rounded, but the ones in the book are probably uh, you know rounded off. This down here, I'm gonna just copy this over because it should be a hundred. Uh, yeah, there we go. So that we know we did the math correct. So if you do this by hand, and you're at the bottom of the individual percent retained um, column, then that should be 100. All right, anybody got any questions on that? Okay, so now let's go to cumulative percent retained. So what cumulative percent retained would be is that if you didn't have 
for any particular sieve. If you didn't have any sieves above that, how much would be on there? So, you know, the, the first one just goes straight over. I'm just gonna put zero there. But the next one is like this, if you could watch my clicker. Can, can you all see my uh, mouse jumping on the screen there? Okay, good. So the next one would be column, what is called row seven here, plus the 10 and a half equals this. So each of these go like this, boom, boom, boom. So if I was to do this one in Excel, I'd be, I'd be like this. I'd be this number plus this number equals that. Ten and a half. Now let's see what happens when I copy that one to the next one. I should get ten and a half plus the twenty-one point two, thirty-one point seven. Good. And then I should be able to just actually copy that all the way down to here. And there are our numbers. So sixty-eight point nine, eighty-six point three. You can see those there. Now let's see if this makes sense. For the pan here, if no other sieve was above that, it should have 100%, all of it, right? Make sense? All right, nothing goes through the pan. So that number should always be 100. If it's not 100 and it's really, really close, it's probably because you rounded something, just a little. Now, the last column that we need to do here is uh, it's percent passing. It's actually a cumulative percent passing, but you, you don't hardly ever say that or see that in the notation. So, you know, most of the time, what I'm saying here is this is not there. And you'll just see percent passing. And this one's real easy. It's just 100. So if I was to do this one, it's 100 minus the cumulative percent retained. So if we put that in uh, like this, it would be that. So, so how much went through the number of the four inch sieve? So we said when we popped the lid on this one and we looked in the four inch sieve, there was zero grams retained. Therefore, all of it, 100% went through or passed the four inch sieve. And so then the rest of these will just follow suit. They'll all be 100 minus the cumulative percent retained. So if I format those cells again, you could do two in, in Excel, but you know, one's okay. The same thing is an easy check. What percent passes the pan? Nothing passes the pan, okay? So that, that number is always gonna be zero. Now, something else to notice here, it's real easy to see when you make a mistake here. These numbers will always start high and always end low. You know, if you got a pan, it's always going to end on zero. It doesn't have to always start at 100. You could have had something on the four inch sieve, but they're always going to start high and go low. There won't be like 100, 89, 68, and then back to a 80 or something, or 70 something. That won't happen. It'll, these numbers will decrease all the way down to the pan. Okay. Everybody good? Thumbs up. Good. Thank you. All right, now I wanna make one more comment real quick because this happens all the time. Uh, and there's actually a certain ASTM tolerance on this. I'm lenient in lab. But you see that when we, when we weight all these on the individual weight retains and we have, um, we have 5,136 grams, you might've started out with 5,140 grams. That might, might've been what you weighed out of the oven. And so you lost four grams here, okay? When you do your numbers, your calculations, you actually need to use this number, which is the total of this individual weight retained and not what you started with. If you do that, you'll have some error over in here. Um, what, what happens is either you don't clean the sieves good, you know, or I've even had students that create, I tell them they create matter. Uh, they'll start with 5,140 and then they'll have 5,142. They created two grams of matter. Well, that's just because they actually clean the sieves a little better than the group or person before them. If that's not the case, uh, since we use digital scales, that's typically the case. The other thing used to be is that people incorrectly uh, weighed the material. So that used to happen some too, but most of the time now with digital scales, it's it's because of the cleaning or non-cleaning of the sieves. All right, now let's talk about, um, let's go back and look at our results here. 
So we know how these numbers come about. Let's look at uh, the plot here. So here's a plot. It's actually two plots of um, two different gradations. The first thing I want you to notice about these plots are uh, on the vertical axis, it is percent passing. Now we just talked about, I just demonstrated how we find percent passing. On the horizontal axis in this particular plot here that I've got, uh, it, it's both on the bottom and the top. The top shows you the standard sizes, uh, like, the, like the sieve designations, like, like here is, um, turn this on, like, like here is a four inch, and this is a three inch, and a two inch, and so on, and it goes all the way down to, uh, looks like a three eighths, that's a three eighths and a half and a three quarter. And then it looks like, I've never seen a number three sieve, but it looks like that's a three. Here's a number four sieve and a six or whatever. Okay. It's important that you know that each of those actually has a, a, an opening size and typically we use millimeters. Now it'll probably show you on the sieve or you could look up a reference that you could find it in inches, but it's best if you just go ahead and use millimeters. For example, one inch is about 25.4 mil, millimeters. So if we look down here, this would be 10, 25.4. So that ought to correspond uh, to one inch. <laughs> All right, so that, that's kind of how that works. Uh, a number four sieve is like 4.76 millimeters. So if you go down here, one, two, three, four, you go up, okay? So if I kick you back out of this one, uh, and this is important to see, if I kick you back out and go to my Excel sheet, in order for you to use Excel to plot these, and I'll show you that, you actually need the size in millimeters. So all I've done here is taken and multiplied four, uh, multiplied the, the inches, so that's down to the half inch, by 25.4. I think I'm a little bit off there, but it's pretty close. You can look these up, they're in your book, uh, or, or just Google it if you want and I just typed in the 4.76. So you can find these sizes. So it's important that you see that. Okay, now let's go back to, uh, go back to our screen here. There, we're almost done. All right, so let's just go over these results. So for aggregate A um, here, we had 100% passing the four inch. So this actually looks like this is, aggregate A is probably the numbers that we just did. Uh, it looks like we had 87 or so percent passing on the three inch, and then the inch and a half, we had about 69. And then the, uh, what was the next one? Was it, I don't know what was below the inch and a half. It was the one inch. Anyway, it was here. And then we had a half inch. And then you had a number four. So this, this plot right here, just zigzag that, that is the one that we just did the calculations for. So how you would do that is you would just take and put a, I actually like to put a smaller dot and then put like a circle around it or a square, something like that and plot percent passing versus grain size in an actual unit like millimeters. Now I wanna mention one thing, this, this looks a little funky. That's because this is called um, a semi-log plot. So the vertical axis is just arithmetic, okay? So just like you see, it, it's equally divided. But the horizontal, the size here, the grain size, it's actually a logarithmic. So we call that semi or half log paper, okay? And then uh, this one may be from your book as well, uh, from B, I don't have that one in the notes, but you can kind of see how that would work. So depending on, this one uh, increases from left to right, okay? But you could also do this from right to left and instead of your uh, instead of your plot going down 
upper left to lower right, it would go upper right to lower left. So you see them like that as well. I think I've got some blank sheets that I'll give you and they're like, they're like this. They'll go upper right to lower left. Either way will work there. Questions about that? All right, I'm gonna do this quick and I'll probably do it again in class, uh, but I think it'll be good to have on the recording. I'll I'm gonna show you real quick in Excel and there's a whole lot of different ways in Excel that uh, you can do things, but I'm gonna show you maybe how I would do this. Um, you can just you can just go up here and say, probably insert. Here's the key thing in Excel if you're doing this, is, is what kind of chart do you want? You do not want a line chart. You want an XY scatter plot, okay? So I'm gonna pick the one XY scatter plot with smooth lines and markers. Now, you can see it through something up there uh, that's incorrect. So I'm gonna right click inside the chart. I'm gonna go select data and I'm just gonna remove all this. And then I'm gonna add my own back. All right, series name, I, I, I don't care right now. Whatever you would wanna name that. My X values here, uh, they're going to be the size and my Y values are going to be percent passing. Can I even get to that? I'm going to do something a little unconventional here. Uh, I don't need that to be E, that's another column, but hold on, we'll fix it. It's in the way. It's uh, H. So I'm gonna plot uh, column D versus column H. So I need to go back in there and change that. So I can edit. And these two E's right here need to be H's. Now, if I could have grabbed the right one, uh, I would have. Okay. Now, uh, you can format this. I'm not going to go over all the formatting, but you could say figure uh, one and call it what you want. And by the way, you can dra drag this to the bottom because we title figures at the bottom. I can drag that up a little bit. But what I want to show you is, and by the way, the axis will need to be labeled now. I want to show you how to, how to make this a semi-log plot. So this Scale here is arithmetic, so it's good. The only thing I like about it is it goes to 120. So I do want to format that axis. So I hit format axis. Ah, pictures are in the way. And I want to make the maximum 100. That should fix that. Okay, good. Now the bottom one, I just click on, click on the numbers or the axis. I use a right click, go format axis, and then there's just a button down here that says logarithmic scale. And once I do that, I'm good. Now, what you don't see here is your minor uh, minor grid lines. So once again, I'm going to click on that axis, and I want to go add minor grid lines. Uh, you can barely see them. And actually, you could go in here over here to the options, the axis options, and you could you could darken those up. Uh, there are ways to do that on the lines. Solid line, make them blue, make them black, whatever you want to do. But there's your semi-log plot. I can change the, uh, that doesn't need to go to 1,000. 100 is good enough. Okay. And I can, you know, I can work on my format. I can show you guys how to do that. But that's how you make a semi-log plot real quickly in Excel. All right, it's probably a good place to stop. Uh, you guys got any questions? Okay, if you do, um, Bring them Monday. We'll kind of kind of rehash this just a little bit. I see a little lady in the background. You guys have a good weekend.